They're relatively small, relatively docile, and yet they're one of the most feared creatures on the planet. In many households, Alex Bardo's unusual pets would receive some pretty rough treatment. I often get people saying, like, uh, if your spider come near me, I'll, I'll do this and I'll do that, you know? And I, have to, I like to wonder what I, like, if, if I said that about their cat or their dog, how would they respond, you know? <laughs> people often uh, uh, question my mental, mental capability just for, uh, just for owning spiders and whatnot. <laughs> Alex has been collecting and selling a variety of invertebrates for about 18 months. His collection would cause as many as one in three women and one in four men to be crippled by fear. Some people would be like, ah, oh, and, and like freak out. Others would, uh, would uh, just, uh, their fascination would be triggered and they'd walk up and ask about them, you know? Yeah, I guess I'm one of the people to ask about them. <laughs> How are you feeling today, baby girl? Are you all mad? At Ken Foose's Exotic Pets in Las Vegas, Gaz is also a fan of tarantulas as pets. They're just such cool animals, you know? It's just they're, you know, they're, I've always found them fascinating. Um, from from the, the tiniest of little, like, common house spiders, you know? They're just fascinating, you know? And they, you know, they keep pest control down, you know, they eat all the little bugs and stuff like that. But, but they're just fascinating. I mean, look how beautiful that is. I mean, you know, check out all that reds and that, you know? It's just beautiful. They're just fascinating animals. Everybody knows that uh, they're not like dogs or cats. They don't need, uh, need affection or any love or communication at all. I think that's what I like about them. They're, they're like nothing else in the world. I guess they're uh, ornamental, primarily. Besides that, though, there is a, a bit of an edge factor of, uh, you know, do you want to see my tarantulas? Everybody's like, oh, yeah, you know? It makes for, um, makes for a good story. It actually started by uh, watching some dumb YouTube videos and uh, just uh, picking up some of my own tarantulas. I actually, uh, I just figured out that there were so many people doing it over east uh, that uh, the, uh, the animals over there have become so common. And uh, there's nobody collecting over in the west, so I thought there were, might be a market for it, so uh, I got more into it, you know? I would say they're pets primarily, yeah. I have my personal uh, collection that I'll never ever sell, and uh, ones that I'll, uh, I'll uh, you know, share around. Australia has very strict laws regarding the keeping of exotic animals, and many people aren't aware that native tarantulas can be kept as pets. I think a lot of people over here don't know that they actually are even native to Australia or even able to be kept. Um, one of the most common questions I get is, um, you know, like, uh, do, we, do we need a license to own these? I even get, uh, have they had their immunity jabs and stuff like this? <laughs> but no, they don't need that. <laughs> Australia has a reputation for its dangerous spiders, but surprisingly, tarantulas aren't among them. While their bite may be painful, it's very rarely fatal. I got bitten by my rose hair, and um, like I said, it was like, and I was probably around about 13, 14 years old, and it got me, um, and it was very shocking. You know, I was kind of like frozen with shock. So a lot of people's reaction is to, whoa, flinch, you know, and you can drop the tarantula, you can kill the tarantula that way. But I was just kind of like frozen in shock being 13, 14 years old, getting bitten by a tarantula the first time. Um, so I didn't really feel the pain or the sting till about maybe 10 minutes after. And, and then it, you know, it started stinging. I had, you know, you know, slight swelling where it had bitten me. But after about 20, 30 minutes, it went away. So that's how I knew I wasn't allergic to those kind of things. <laughs> you know, which is probably a good thing because, you know, people get stung by bees and they have allergic reactions. It's, it's you know, it can be deadly. There is a chance for anaphylaxis with any kind of bite, with any kind of venom. There's been zero recorded deaths from tarantulas in, in throughout history. Uh, so you could even argue that uh, snails or anything is uh, more dangerous. There are two types of tarantula, old world species from the eastern hemisphere and new world species from the western hemisphere. In Australia, all we get is old world species and they're 160 million years old predators. They operate completely off instinct and they haven't been watered down through breeding to be, uh, you know, prettier or uh, slower, less venomous and stuff like that. But the new worlds, they've been, uh, the color's been brought out in them and the placid, um, the placid behavior and whatnot. The new worlds are um, much more prone to being handled. Uh, in fact, most tarantulas will keep. Yeah, will tell you not to old, handle an old world at all. Yeah, yeah, they're very quick, very, uh, very fast, <laughs> unpredictable. Thank you. Tarantulas in the wild are nighttime hunters, pouncing on insects, beetles, and grasshoppers.
the goliath bird eating tarantula species of South America will eat larger prey, such as lizards, snakes, small birds, and mice. For a mouse, like, you know, it's, it's venom's powerful. Um, but like I said, for someone like us, like a healthy adult, you know, that's not allergic to those kind of things, it's, like I said, it's just like a bee sting. But for something that small, it's quite powerful. And plus, their fangs are pretty big, you know, so, that, you know, it can cause mechanical damage as well, you know. If it gets a certain animal in the right place, you know, it's going into its heart, it's going into its lungs, it's going to kill it a lot quicker, you know. So I think most of the time, you know, the damage is caused by the, you know, the, the size of the fangs, you know. They, they bite into a mouse with those size of the fangs and, you know, it's like getting stabbed in the heart or something like that, you know, it's, it's gonna cause that mechanical damage. So the venom's not really gonna kill it, but the mechanical damage is gonna kill it. All the hairs that cover their body, they can feel like the slightest vibrations of like prey, you know, they can tell exactly what kind of prey it is as well by the way it moves on the ground. And, you know, they feel the different vibrations through sensitive hairs on their legs. Very strong, very powerful. And as like, like I said, the first time I got bit by a tranche, I couldn't believe how strong it was, you know? The way they can grip you with their legs and pull, pull you in, it, I was just like, wow, you know? And that was just a rose hair. <laughs> you know, a rose hair is a pretty small tranche compared to these, so these guys are really powerful. Alex's pet powerhouses are fed on cockroaches and mealworms that he breeds himself. For spiderlings, I, I feed every three days, and uh, for adults, I feed once a week or so. But uh, adults can go 18 months without eating, so you can go away on holiday and still come back and, and be fine, you know? Yeah, mostly they look after themselves and thrive on darkness and loneliness. Although adept hunters in the wild, Alex says that tarantulas are not aggressive creatures. Aggressive is actually the wrong word for it. Uh, defensive would be the word for it. But uh, this one right here, that's a Selenotypus uh, wallace. She's, uh, she's a more calm one, but the uh, Selenophilus cotsman, which I've got in the garage there, uh, that's uh, arguably the most defensive tarantula in the world, actually. Along with his tarantulas, Alex keeps other arachnids known for their fierce and painful defense. It depends on the species, I would say. I've got the uh, Eurodacus elongatus over here, and that is, um, I'd say, one of the most uh, calm species in the world, actually. But uh, something like the Eurodacus uh, yashunkai, I wouldn't even go near. She did give me a clip yesterday, see that? That's a threat pose. She's getting a bit stressed, I'm gonna put her away. So she gets too stressed while rabbit. Uh, well, when she uh, when she puts the babies out, she'll um, she'll uh, eat them. Go on. Go that way. In your hole. Good girl. Scorpions are also nocturnal hunters, and they do something else in the dark that is very unique. All species glow under ultraviolet light. It might seem difficult to know which end of the scorpion to avoid. Pincers that are used to crush their prey or the sting in the tail that delivers toxic venom. Well, some of them can be quite bad. Most of the ones that I own, the Eurodaca scorpions, uh, they're, they're not too bad, but um, they're only about as dangerous as a bee, just like a tarantula. But I know of one called the Lychas bachari, which is uh, native to all of Australia. That will give me uh, a fair bit of pain, put me in hospital for a few days. Small pincers means a strong venom, and uh, strong pincers means a weak venom. Like the tarantulas, these arachnids don't return affection the way the more traditional pets do. But Alex has seen that they are not unintelligent critters. I think all animals, no matter how uh, uh, small the brain and instinctual they are, uh, they can get used to certain behaviors. Like um, if, I, if I feed one scorpion only mealworms and then I go to a cockroach, then they'll recognize that it's a different food. and. Uh, Oh, we've got Maggie here as well. That's my other animal. I'm pretty sure she's got a family somewhere nearby. She comes and gets some worms for herself, uh, goes and gives them to the babies, and then comes back for her own meal, you know? She usually comes back twice. Good girl. I do that whistle every time so she gets to know uh, part of my voice, you know? She eats too many of these. I end up having, having to buy more, you know? <laughs> right, go and get out. You need to learn how to hunt again. <laughs> the Australian magpie is known for its intelligence and for its habit of fiercely defending its nest by swooping at unsuspecting passers-by. No, no, she's never swooped me. Uh, I don't think I've seen her in mating season, though. I'm not sure. I could be wrong. I do worry about this guy on my shoulder with her around, though. The guy on Alex's shoulder isn't a predator. 
but it's definitely an unorthodox creature to keep for companionship. Its extraordinary body is designed to look like the leaves it feeds on. If threatened, it will arch its tail above its body towards the intruder, much like the scorpion. This is a spiny leaf insect. It's one of the stick insect family. And uh, these guys are native to, uh, I think this one's from northern Queensland, but they might be, uh, might be all over Australia. They're not my expertise, these, uh, these guys. But uh, what's interesting about them is uh, this is a female right now. You can, you can see that by their smaller wings. Males have bigger wings. And uh, basically, the, uh, the female will always give birth throughout her life, but she'll only give birth to females uh, if, she, uh, if she doesn't mate with a male. And if she mates with a male, then it'll be 50% female, 50% male. Interesting, huh? The spiny leaf insect is obviously not Alex's most dangerous predator, but neither is Maggie, the tarantulas, or the scorpions. The giant centipede is found across Australia, and its venom is toxic to both insects and mammals. These multi-legged creepers can reach up to 16 centimeters long and have even been known to feed on small snakes. I've been bitten by a centipede, but not by an adult. It was only a peedling and uh, it, it couldn't get through the skin. It was, that, uh, it was that small. I was trying to dig around for it under the soil, so it was a bit irresponsible of me. He must have just like felt something and then just uh, had a bit of a tag. It was like a pinch. Alex got away lightly. The bite from the giant centipede causes severe pain that can last several days. I would say that aggressive is again the wrong word for it. Defensive is the proper word, but if I was gonna use it for anything, it would be, it would be centipedes. Centipedes, if they bite you, they'll, they'll hurt for a much longer time than a tarantula or a scorpion. I've, uh, I've kept uh, tarantulas and scorpions for 18 months, but centipedes, I don't think I'll ever get used to. They're just so unpredictable and uh, They can use those pincers on their back and, and uh, grab, grab my finger and then try and like, uh, walk back up themselves and onto my finger. This is what I mean by unpredictable and just, they freak me out a little bit. <laughs> Despite its name, the giant centipede has only 21 or 23 pairs of legs. The first pair of legs behind its head are modified claws which curve around the head and can deliver venom into its prey. Go on, have a munch. Good lad. This species is common across Australia. And while out searching for a different species, he discovered a new color form of this one, endemic to Western Australia. It's native to all of Australia, but this particular one had uh, blue and green legs, so we call it the Perth form locale. Like uh, the form is like uh, the color form, and the locale is usually like the location where it was collected from, and that's what we use to uh, to identify them over here. For example, like uh, Australian tarantulas, they're mainly recognised as Selenocosmia crassipes by uh, by science. But uh, anything beyond that is just a trade name. So for example, uh, Selenotypus Wallace, this one here, uh, she's, uh, that's just a trade name. It's just uh, you know, uh, something to identify where it's from, the color form. We were looking for Cerisophonius grandulosus, and we just found uh, so many of these, uh, this Cormocephalus orantopes around. We ended up collecting about 15 and then trying to sex them. But uh, it's, it's a bit hard, that one, because uh, to sex a centipede, you have to either give it some carbon dioxide uh, until, it's, uh, until it's unconscious and then squeeze out the sexual organs to be able to see it. Or you can, uh, you can drown them for north of half an hour to be able to, to, be able to see it. <laughs> so I don't think I'll be mating them anytime soon. Alex does breed some of his own tarantulas and scorpions. Others come from other licensed dealers. Regulations differ from state to state. It's legal, but uh, poaching is more common in, uh, in my industry than I ever would have thought previously. There's people that go to uh, people's property without permission from the owners, and there's people that don't have licenses to actually collect from the West. It's, it's unfortunate how it all happens, but um, the people in the scene, from the activists to the, uh, to the licensed collectors to the breeders, it's a pretty tight-knit community. So it's, uh, it's pretty easy for us to, um, to, uh, to track where the spiders go and, and where they come from, which ones are legal and whatnot. Alex is licensed to collect some specimens from the wild. Those that come from other breeders arrive in a somewhat surprising way. Like all of us, Alex enjoys the rush of having a parcel arrive in the mail. It's kind of got less exciting as time went on. This must be, this must be my like 500th tarantula or something like that. So it gets less exciting, of course. <laughs> There's a roach in that one as well. However, the local mailman is 
not nearly as fond of Alex's deliveries. He freaks out, and uh, it's, it always seems like he's in a rush to leave every time he comes over, you know? 